Isabel Ayala, and uh, I'm happy to introduce the speaker today. Um, and the topic is actually a pretty important one. It doesn't have to do with marine life. Actually, it has to do with life <laughs> and water. So it's marine life today. And if you have been watching the news uh, recently, there's a lot of uh, talk about, I'm not talking about Trump, um, talk about <laughs> earthquakes, actually, besides Trump. And uh, there, were, there was uh, actually on CNN this morning, the, the front page of CNN, they were um, uh, talking about the recent report from the SGS, that's where Janet works, about the Hayward Fall being a potential hazard, actually a sure hazard, and uh, they were talking about a scenario in which 800,000 people might die for a magnitude 7 earthquake because the Hayward Fall runs in the East Bay of San Francisco. And on New York, New York Times, they're going to show a slide with that. There's a really interesting article showing how much of San Francisco is uh, exposed to earthquake hazard, especially now that we build the very high raised buildings. So people are kind of low for, for a good reason because of the size of the feet. So it's, and you know, and when you, when you have geologists like me that finally buy earthquake insurance, you know that's coming. <laughs> I did it because I. You know, I think it's about time to get that. That'll ensure that we don't have an earthquake. Yeah. Um, <laughs> besides that, <laughs> so the topic today is very important, it's very relevant, and, uh, and also um, it's very nice to have Janet here because Janet is a Moss Landing graduate. And she graduated in 2004 with, four with Professor uh, Green and myself, actually, as a young uh, scientist back then. And, uh, and she was already working at the SGS in a um, in Mellow Park, doing more, more of a land stuff, geophysical stuff. Uh, but finally, in 2010, she moved to uh, Santa Cruz, the Pacific Center, and she went back to her original law, which is marine geology. And since then, she's been working, well, in San Francisco Bay, but also right now she's working in Cascadia. So, uh, doing a lot of offshore, offshore work using uh, seismic, uh, using uh, gravimetry, magnetic anomaly, and People who took my classes know what I'm talking about. The other people can just hear the word and say, oh, cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Janet. And please, thank you. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Um, the last time I think I stood up here, I was defending my master's thesis. So that was much less fun, but this will be more fun. Um, yeah, today I'm going to tell you about how we've used a lot of fun and different tools um, to get at uh, earthquake hazards underneath San Pablo Bay, um, which is where the Hayward Fault and the Rogers Creek Fault meet. So when I give these talks and I explain the rationale for why we're doing a specific study, um, I usually say, well, it's because we're trying to improve earthquake hazards. And it's, people just, OK, but what does that really mean? Um, and so here I'm showing four earthquake hazard products that the USGS puts out. And on the left, um, so our site-specific studies when we go in and characterize a fault zone, um, what we are looking for are um, uh, basically uh, faults that cut young deposits, basically that are less than a, about a million and a half years, quaternary deposits. And those are considered the most likely um, faults to have an earthquake, and they go in the Quaternary Fault and Fold database, which is shown here on the left. Um, and that fault database is, is the basis for the th next three products um, down the line. The next map shows the probability of a major earthquake on Bay Area faults in the next 30 years. Um, so it's important on the building scale for, for humans inhabiting um, the Bay Area. Um, and these probabilities take into consideration the geometry of these faults, but also the um, decades of earthquake research that's gone into understanding the size and frequency of past events to get at these probabilities. Um, given estimated earthquake size and frequency, plus knowledge about local geology, what kind of soil you're on, bedrock versus um, loose soil, um, seismologists can estimate the amount of shaking that is likely to occur in every, any given area. Um, which is portrayed in the U.S. seismic hazard maps that are shown here. And those seismic hazard maps are used as the basis for design, uh, used to design building codes for wh where you can build buildings and to what structural standards. And they're also used to determine insurance rates in the United States. 
And then um, the map on the right shows uh, a shake map from a, the scenario 7.1, 7.0 earthquake on the Hayward Fault in the haywired scenario that Ivana mentioned. Um, and basically that map shows that a, an earthquake there, it shows the distribution of strong shaking. And what I hope, it, it's kind of small, but what I hope you can see, the red is strong shaking and goes to the blues, which are light shaking. But the, the red is not just along the fault itself. Because one thing, shaking is strongest, closest to um, where the epicenter is, but it also depends on the soils and the geology um, around you. So basins amplify shaking. So a lot of the red areas that are shown in that map are areas where you have basins. Um, so today, here's just a road map um, for what I'm going to talk about. First, I will explain more about the motivation for this particular work and what the scientific questions are that we're trying to answer, and then how we use sound to image faults in the marine environment. And I'll talk about how we connect these surface faults that we see at the surface to where earthquakes occur, which is at kilometers depth below the surface, um, and sort of connect the 3D fault mapping. And then how we use what I call acoustic trenching um, to unravel the history of earthquakes along a fault, somewhat akin to paleoseismic trenching that's done onshore. And of course, the, the impetus for all this is that understanding past earthquakes will help us prepare for future ones. So the big question that uh, folks are after in seismology and earthquake hazards is, uh, these days is why do some earthquakes cascade into multi-fault events and others do not? So why do some earthquakes, are, are they just magnitude four and they only rupture a certain portion, small portion of a fault and, and others um, rupture mo multiple sections of a fault at one time and cascade into these large and, and, and devastating earthquakes? And as a researcher, I have an affinity, or I guess I'd call an obsession, um, with fault discontinuities, or places where faults intersect, or they bend, or jog. Um, and the reason I'm fascinated with these places, because I think um, they likely hold the key to understanding why some of these earthquakes stop where they do, and some blow through these little sections or intersections where the faults make little jogs. So until recently, the prevailing theory was that earthquakes are confined to fault segments, little sections that break over and over again. Um, shown here, I have a fault in gray, and these segment boundaries are the blue boxes. And the fault ruptures in a red zone in between these two segment boundaries was sort of the idea that um, was prevailing. But recent earthquakes um, have shown us that that idea um, doesn't always work. Sometimes earthquakes rupture single segments, but oftentimes they rupture multiple segments at one time. Um, and, and a recent example of this, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but the, the recent earthquake in Kaikoura, um, New Zealand, magnitude 7.8, it ruptured at least 10 faults separated by kilometers from each other. Um, in addition, it was thought it, this is on a subduction uh, intersection where there's a subduction zone coming in, intersecting with a strike slip fault zone. Um, and I think also the subduction megathrust might have been involved in this earthquake. So it's showing us that ruptures can be a lot more complex than this single segment model um, that we used to follow. So we know that that's not true all the time. So when you have a fault discontinuity, a jog in the fault, these fault strike slip faults um, where Earth is moving laterally past one another. And when you have a bend in the fault zone, it's constantly trying to straighten itself out. And what that means is these areas are inherently unstable. They're, they're constantly rearranging um, their geometries to try to get to optimal and straighten themselves out. And what that results in is a complex geologic record at the surface, because the fault's jumping around through time. And what we need to do to address hazard is understand which of these faults are currently active at the surface, and how, is the, how are these faults interconnected to one another? How might they interact in, in an earthquake? The other thing we need to do is understand how what we see at the surface, so this is sort of a cross section here, we identify a surface trace, but we need to understand um, what is the down dip geometry of that fault? How does, how does it connect to where earthquakes occur, which is at kilometers below the Earth's surface. Um, 
And we, we need to understand how often um, earthquakes rupture on these faults. So this is a screen grab from that Quaternary Fault, now zoomed in on the Bay Area. Um, San Pablo Bay is right here. The Hayward and Rogers Creek Faults here run through the Bay Area, and they're part of the larger San Andreas Fault System, which here in the Bay Area comprises multiple strands. Movement uh, on the plate boundary here is, is distributed amongst a number of faults. The Hayward and Rogers Creek Faults are, are one of those. Um, fault systems. Note that there are no faults mapped in San Pablo Bay. So these lines were drawn and they just sort of stop where it hits the water. We know that the fault in the geology probably doesn't just stop where you hit the water. Um, so why is it important to understand the geometry here where these two faults meet? Well, this is one of those segment boundaries. So in the hazard models, this is a segment boundary and earthquakes that rupture this part aren't thought to go up to this part very often. Um, so we need to understand what, what the structural relationship is in one of these segment boundaries to, to understand if, if these two faults might act together in the, in the future or if they've acted together in the past. So and of course, Vano hinted the importance of understanding activity along this fault because the Hayward Fault runs along the East Bay Hills um, in a heavily populated area. Um, San Francisco Bay boasts the fourth largest economy in the U.S. and ranks among the top 20 in the world. So there's a lot at stake when this fault goes. And the most recent large earthquake on the Hayward Fault was in 1868, um, almost 150 years ago. And the five earthquakes before that occurred approximately at 140 year intervals. Um, so ge earthquake geologists like to say this fault is due um, for its next earthquake. And the reason, um, we're studying this area because because of that earthquake recurrence interval and when the last earthquake occurred, the Hayward and Rogers Creek fault zone is the most likely barrier of fault to experience a large earthquake within the next 30 years. And how big an earthquake um, could this be? Well, the size of an earthquake is based um, mainly on the length of the fault that ruptures. Okay, so if you have a longer fault and these two faults are connected, you're gonna get a bigger earthquake than if the, um, just this part of the fault ruptures. And so the, based on recent mapping, the length of this entire system is up to 190 kilometers long, going from north of Healdsburg down to Alum Rock, um, where there was just a little earthquake the other day. Um, and based on the length of that fault, it could experience a max, uh, up to a 7.4 earthquake. So the ability of an earthquake to break through from the Rogers Creek to the Hayward or from the Hayward to the Rogers Creek um, greatly depends on the geometrical relationship of these um, faults beneath San Pablo Bay. And until now, that relationship has remained uncertain. So the goals of this project, um, they were in two phases. Um, the first phase um, involved definitively locating and characterizing the most recently active Hayward Rogers Creek Fault in 3D in the San Pablo Bay. And then constrain the earthquake history along this portion of the fault. So the first involves an integrated geophysical approach. We need to use multiple geophysical tools to understand um, how this fault, what the geometry of this fault is. And then to constrain the earthquake timing, we need to go out and sample the sediments that are offset. By this, by this fault to understand the age component, the time component. So here I'm zooming in on San Pablo Bay. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the area. This is Point Pinole here where the Hayward Fault goes offshore. This is Sears Point. There's Sears Raceway up here. You're familiar. The Rogers Creek um, comes down here. Uh, where the faults enter the bay, they are separated by about five kilometers. Um, and the shallow water depth, this, this entire bay, I was telling Ivano, is less than five meters deep. And there's also widespread gas in the sediments um, below the seafloor. Both of those things make it very difficult to, one, get a ship in to do any sort of geophysical imaging. And if you, get the Im if you do some imaging, the gas scatters all the sound energy. So it's very, 
difficult place to image, and it's likely one of the reasons why this area has remained sort of uncertain um, for, for many years. So the geometry and connectivity of these two faults beneath the bay has been debated for, for years, with workers describing the, the relationship as either a step over or a fault bend. And of course, so this is a right lateral strike slip fault. So if you stand on one side of the fault and look to the other, it's moving to the right and things are moving laterally. And a step over is where there's an actual jump between the two faults. There's a, a break in the faults. And here, a fault bend, they're connected, but there's a discontinuity there. And resolving this uncertainty is particularly important because these alternative models have different implications for earthquake dynamics um, and ground motions um, that, along these fault zones. So none of these interpretations previously were supported by direct evidence of near surface active faulting. So phase one, um, there were two components to this, document active faulting in San Pablo Bay. And to do this, we used ultra high resolution CHIRP seismic reflection. And it's a sound source that's able to image tens of meters below the surface in centimeter scale vertical resolution. And then we wanted to link these near surface fault, the near surface faulting that we see to depths where earthquakes occur. And to do that, we integrate the near surface observations with marine magnetics, um, existing geologic and geophysical information, gravity, and we also used um, physics-based deformation modeling. So a lot of different tools to get the 3D picture here. So here I'm showing, this is an on-land seismic experiment in the East Bay. And these on-land seismic experience, uh, experiments are notoriously difficult to one permit, um, and they're very, the data are very noisy. Um, so imaging, particularly in an urban environment, can be very tricky on land. An example, they have to basically drill holes and put dynamite down these holes um, on private property, which is not always popular. Um, in order to image, this, this seismic line goes across the Hayward Fault, I think near the town of Hayward here. But we're lucky in the marine environment because we don't, we have different sort of obstacles, but we don't have the, we still have to get permits, but we're able to tow a sound source behind a vessel and cross the fault many times, basically mowing the lawn, going back and forth. So that's what these yellow lines are, are these seismic profiles that we collected with the chirp towed behind a, a small vessel. And we were able to cross the fault 13 times and and it characterized the changes in fault deformation along strike, because strike slip faults are notorious for changing. Anytime they take a little jog, de the deformation pattern changes um, quite quickly along strike. And of course, in the marine environment, we have active marine sedimentation, which provides is a tape recorder of past events. So we have more of a depositionary, a depositional environment in the marine environment than on land where it's mostly erosion. So for those of you in the room that aren't um, very familiar with seismic reflection, I sort of show this cartoon to explain how it works a bit. Um, again, we have a survey vessel and a sound source here, and these acoustic waves propagate down through the water column and into the subsurface, and they're reflected from layers that show contrast in what we call acoustic impedance, physical properties. Um, and then that sound is reflected and recorded by the hydrophones on the receiver. And the data is processed to pr produce a 2D cross-section of the sediment layers below the seafloor, like a road cut. So the system we're using is called a CHIRP, and that stands for Compressed High Intensity Radar Pulse. Um, and it uses a high frequency acoustic source, a swept frequency from two to 12 kilohertz, very high frequency sound source. It means we get very, um, not very deep penetration, but very high resolution imaging. Um, vertical resolution is on the order of centimeters. So here, the source and receiver are on the same unit. This is the chirp unit here. And because of the shallow waters in the Bay Area, we had to tow it on a pontoon so we could tow it at the surface, otherwise it would basically dive into the Bay mud um, behind the vessel. Um, but due to the persistent gas layers, we were only able to image the upper two to five meters below the sea floor. But that's what makes this tool a very good tool and basically the only tool in our seismic um, toolbox that could image that, that part of the subsea floor in high resolution. 
So here is an example of a seismic profile from the northern part of San Pablo Bay here. And you can see, so we have the seafloor is this really strong, we call these reflectors right here. And again, it's like a road cut, um, a cross section through the earth. You see right here this knife cut through these otherwise relatively horizontal layers. You have some folding over here, but relatively flat lying over here. Um, this is the Hayward Fault we're seeing right here. And here is that nasty gas layer where all the sound is scattered below this point. Um, notice the vertical scale here. This is about a meter, so we're only imaging a couple meters below the seafloor here. But luck luckily, those few meters are very revealing. So basically what we do on all these profiles is locate those knife cuts in the section and connect the dots across the bay. Um, and here are just some examples um, from north to south, how the fault can look quite different in cross section as you go across the bay. Um, here we have sediments sort of folded into the fault zone. This, the motion is down to this side and up on this side and it's reversed over here. That's quite common on strike-slip faults when you have horizontal motion and bends. The motion changes relative motion along strikes. What we noticed, though, when we were connecting these dots is that the Hayward Fault had originally been thought to just extend straight over here, but instead it was starting to bend toward, right towards the, the Rogers Creek Fault. Um, oh, I was gonna say, so the displacement that we were measuring on this fault was up to, um, was always less than or equal to about 20 centimeters. So it's not a lot of vertical displacement. Most of the displacement on this fault is horizontal, but we can't measure horizontal displacement with this method. So these chirp data represent the first direct evidence of active faulting along the Hayward Fault in San Pablo Bay. But what happens when you go on shore, right? There's a gap here. So we can see the fault here. It's pointing right towards over here, but we can't use a boat anymore. So the Southern Rogers Creek Fault here um, branches into two faults um, at its southern end. The eastern strand follows the main trend of the fault further to the north and extends out into the bay. And that's what previous interpretations had extended the fault out this way. But the western strand um, diverges by about 22 degrees um, and goes along a very straight topographic gradient along this side of Sears Point. The seismic data that we have at the CHIRP data show no definitive evidence for offset in the near surface along this projected strand. And I'll show some evidence or lack of evidence in, in the next slide. The western strand points towards the offshore Hayward Fault along distinct linear gradient and topographic LIDAR um, along here. So here are two seismic cross sections across the bay. Here I'm showing, this is a previous um, interpretation of this fault intersection by one of my co-authors on, on this paper, Tom Parsons. Um, and here I'm showing these chirp profiles and where the Rogers Creek Fault is projected, we don't see near surface deformation um, along there. Whereas here's the Hayward Fault where we see a clear deformation in the near surface. But I must say that the lack of shallow subsurface offset doesn't preclude the existence of um, these previously mapped structures, but instead says that if they're present, they're currently inactive or they haven't produced near surface slip um, within the age of the image stratigraphic section. And the one thing is we don't know the age of the image stratigraphic section yet, but we, we soon will. We presume it's very young sediments um, in this upper section because we're very close to the near surface and there's, there's no bedrock um, at the surface. So the integrated onshore offshore geophysical evidence described above strongly suggests the Hayward and Rogers Creek faults are directly connected along this red dashed line. And for reference, these are sort of previous interpretations of, of the fault. However, because our onshore evidence of faulting is not nearly as good as our offshore evidence, we um, wanted to see if our proposed connection to the Rogers Creek Fault made physical sense um, 
So I enlisted my colleague Tom Parsons at the USGS um, to help me with some deformation modeling. And basically, to do this deformation modeling, you put in a fault surface, um, and then you apply a slip rate to this mesh, and you deform it based on known slip rates in the area. And the land deforms, and some parts go up and some parts go down. Um, and then you can see if that modeling makes sense with your observations from seismic and other geologic data. And so what we see when we apply a model um, that the zone of greatest subsidence, which is blue, shown in blue, is consistent with, so the black dots here are seismicity. So something's happening here. Um, active, active deformation is occurring here. There's also a subtle elongate depression or sag ob observed in the seismic profiles right here, coincident with this area of predicted subsidence. So here are two seismic profiles from the northern end of the bay where you, we have this sag that I'm talking about. And so I'm showing you here, here's the Hayward Fault, and this is this very subtle sag in, in the, along the Hayward Fault Zone, right in the area that's predicted by our deformation model. And what we think this sag represents is what's called um, a lazy Z fault bend basin that has been recognized in other strike slip fault systems around the world. It's a very common thing that you get when you have a slight right bend in, in a fault, in a strike slip, right lateral strike slip fault. The one thing about this sag is that it also is an area of active sedimentation where we're likely to have, there's good potential for, for preserving a record of past events. So our onshore offshore geophysical evidence combined with this deformation modeling shows the Hayward and Rogers Creek faults are li most likely directly connected through a fault bend in the basin. And this direct connection, of course, makes it easier for an earthquake to rupture from the Hayward to Rogers Creek because the two faults are basically holding hands instead of standing next to each other. Now, how do we connect the surface trace to depths where earthquakes occur? How do we get an idea of the down-dip geometry of our fault? We have to use different types of data, indirect measurements of, of the subsurface. And there are many tools that we can use and did use in this study, but I'm just going to focus on uh, the gravity and magnetics um, because that's kind of my favorite. And just to note, the interpretation of all these data involve assumptions and uncertainties. So the idea is um, a need for an integrated approach because the more overlapping data types you have, you get a more comprehensive answer. So how do we use gravity and magnetics? We take advantage of the fact that faults often juxtapose uh, units with contrasting physical properties, densities and magnetic properties. So it results in gravity and magnetic anomalies. We can map the edges of these um, magnetic or dense units using horizontal gradient maxima. Um, and if those boundaries correspond to fault traces, then we can estimate fault dip. So here is a marine magnetic map, an air magnetic map that has existed in the area before we went out and did our marine work. And here, for baseline, is the previous interpreted trace of the Hayward Fault coming out here. So what these colors represent they reflect the amount of magnetite, primarily, within crustal rocks. And the warm colors are magnetic highs, the cool colors are dipole or magnetic lows. Um, and these regional data were collected about 500 meter line spacing, but our marine data that were collected in the bay on a boat had 200 meter line spacing, a lot of line. And this is what the new data look like, a much sharper image um, a lot more high frequency information in, the, in these data. So what we see here in these data is the fault traverses the bay, it follows the northeast boundary of these um, prominent anomalies which I've labeled A and B here. The sources of which are probably rocks like serpentinite and coast range ophiolite that have a lot of magnetite in them. Um, we also see these subtle linear short wavelength anomalies and gradients along the fault trace that we, there, we wouldn't be able to see with that regional aeromagnetic data. 
And these are likely to reflect folding and a vertical offset of tertiary volcanic rocks within the fault zone. So here is an isostatic gravity map of the same area. And these X's mark where we have, see the fault in our seismic profiles. And so gravity anomalies here reflect the lateral density variation in the, in the upper crust. And here it's due to the dense Franciscan basement rocks on this side of the fault and lower density tertiary sedimentary rocks on the other side of the fault. And the maximum horizontal gradient here is demarked by that white dashed line corresponds to the fault mapped with our seismic data and marine magnetics. And what this tells us is that our near surface um, fault zone does in fact extend to depth um, because these data are reflecting um, physical property contrasts that go down deep into the upper crust. So it's not just a, a, a thin splay of a fault surface. So we can estimate fault dip if we have a physical property contrast across a fault um, based on this horizontal gradient. If the fault juxtaposes different densities at the surf and the surface trace is known, which it is in this case, and is by the red line in these examples, you can determine the dip of the fault at depth from the position of this horizontal gradient relative to the, um, the, the anomaly profile. So here, when it's in the center of this, this gradient, it's, we have a vertical contrast. Whereas if it's at the top of this concave, you have a, a dip this way. If it's at the bottom, you have a dip this way. So in San Pablo Bay, the shape of the gradient suggests a vertical to steeply northeast dipping fault. So now we have an idea of where the fault is at the surface, the likely shape of the fault, how it extends to depth. Um, now the next step, the path that this, an earthquake rupture takes depends not only on the shape of that fault and its connectivity, but also on other factors, occur, including earthquake history. Um, how often this fault has, has gone in the past and whether it's close to, it's built up enough stress um, to be released in, a, in an earthquake. So for that, we need to understand the earthquake history of the fault, the entire fault zone itself. Um, and geodetic and paleoseismic evidence from trenching across the fault indicate that the Hayward and Rogers Creek faults have each accumulated enough stress to produce large earthquakes. So they're both late in their seismic cycles. One question we have is, have these faults ruptured together in the past? Is there any evidence of that? Well, in fact, estimates of timing of the most recent event along the Rogers Creek Fault and prehistoric events along the Hayward Fault, um, their age, ages of the last events overlap in the mid-1700s. Um, so it allows the possibility that there's potentially a combined rupture in the mid-1700s between these two faults. And of course, there's a lot of uncertainty with these age models. Um, and so the more data points we have along the fault zone, um, the better. So perhaps we can get an earthquake history um, age model in San Pablo Bay. And so what we're looking at, um, paleoseismology or trenching onshore is looking, um, basically you identify a fault, this is a trench in Lake Tahoe that's open. And then you build, you dig a trench across it, and you're looking for growth stratigraphy or event, event stratigraphy along that fault surface. And so basically the idea is that you, pre-earthquake, you have flat-lying sediments. An earthquake occurs, you get this uh, scarp forming, you get erosion of that scarp, and you form what's called a colluvial wedge. And then as time goes on, you get a flat-lying sediment package on top. And this creates growth strata on these colluvial wedges um, that if you go in and date the layers, the unoffset layers above and below these colluvial wedges, you can bracket in the timing of, of events. But of course, you can't just trench anywhere. You have to target areas where you have active sedimentation um, that can record history of fault movement. And as I mentioned, offshore in San Pablo Bay, our seismic stratigraphy shows us that we have a depot center um, in the northern part of the bay that perhaps records, has a, a record of that history. And this diagram on the right is just another example of, we call um, this growth faulting, what we see in seismic stratigraphy. And so this red line is the fault. If you have an earthquake event, one side goes down, 
you get deposition to fill that accommodation space, flat lying layers on top, repeated events, and you have sort of what we call growth fault, evidence of growth faulting. Um, so what we did is go out and core across, on either side of the fault and get age models on this side and this side to try to understand the history of movement on these sediment layers on either side. Um, and this is a picture of our coring crew that we went out with on a barge in San Pablo Bay. This guy right here is very well known to Allison at Moss Manning. That's her husband, Dan Powers. Um, yeah, so we went out and we cored in the bay. And this is the barge that we used to do our coring. And this is a vibracore. Um, this is an A-frame. So basically what happens, you go out and you raise this device up on your A-frame put it in the water, this is extremely calm conditions by the way, it doesn't get any more perfect than this. Um, and this core is driven into the subsea floor with the vibrating head here. And then you take the core out, take out a core liner, which you can see here, these clear core liners, and then we take, go back to the lab. And what we did along the fault zone, you see lots of these blue dots are our core sites. Um, what we tried to do is take cores on either side of the fault, because we know precisely where it is. Um, in multiple areas to try to look at this event stratigraphy. So we take those back to the lab um, and we scan the cores um, in the lab and measure things like P wave velocity, magnetic susceptibility, electrical resistivity, gamma density, um, and then as well as photographing the core. And we do this to get these physical properties so we can, um, one reason we do it is to match these cores up, try to put them in the context of our seismic data um, so that we can link the stratigraphy that we see in the seismic data to what's happening, in, to what we see in the cores. And then we split the cores open and do core dis detailed core description and subsampling for, for dating because we want to get ages on these um, uh, sediment layers to understand which layers are offset and which layers aren't. And what we're trying to get at is, when did this fault last move, and do we have a history of events recorded in this stratigraphy? And so here in this seismic section, we basically have no offset of these layers up here, but then below this, we have offset, fault offset here. And we want to understand the timing of this area, and there's also um, preliminary dates are showing that there's a large offset um, down here as well. So. All of this core work and dating takes a long time and um, is relatively new to me, so we're still working on it. And I'll have to come back and tell you what we find. Um, it's a work in progress. But so in summary, we have integrated onshore-offshore analysis that shows that most recent trace of the Hayward Fault does in fact connect to the Rogers Creek through a gentle fault bend. Um, and the gravity data suggests the fault is vertical to steeply northeast dipping. So we've collected and begun analyzing cores in the bay to understand how the fault zone has evolved through time and when the last earthquake ruptured this submerged part of the fault. So implications for earthquake hazard. Of course, this direct link enables rupture of the two faults together, um, a scenario that could result in a magnitude 7.4 earthquake that would be cause extensive, extensive damage is, great, is larger than the magnitude seven scenario, haywire scenario that they were um, discussing uh, recently. And for local perspective, a magnitude 7.4 would release about five times the energy as the 1989 um, magnitude 6.9 Loma Prieta earthquake that some of you might have been around for. Um, and that caused 63 deaths and an estimated six to 10 billion in property loss. And th this, this earthquake was located quite a long distance from the Bay Area, which I don't think a lot of people appreciate. They think, oh, I live in the Bay Area, my house survived the, 19 the, the Loma Prieta earthquake. Well, that ep the epicenter of that earthquake is quite, quite far from the Bay Area. So an earthquake within the Bay Area would have much um, more damaging effects. So this is a, a scenario earthquake that was done of a magnitude 7.2 rupture of both the Hayward and Rogers Creek faults with an, epi um, an epicenter in San Pablo Bay. 
this scenario was run with a, a fault step over, so the faults aren't connected here. But what you can see, this red is all the strong shaking um, along the fault. And it's widespread, the entire Bay Area. Let's see, it's landing. Well, Santa Cruz doesn't, doesn't look to fare so badly, but um, Livermore Valley doesn't look so good in this scenario. And that's because this is a valley filled with alluvial sediments that amplify seismic shaking. But so what our data show that the faults are connected, um, these scenarios are very sensitive um, to fault geometries. And in near field ground motions, um, would likely be significantly different in this step over zone if they were to redo this scenario with a connected fault. So luckily, um, we're a little more advanced in our, our seismic resiliency than some parts of the country. San Francisco has recently passed um, retrofit law and are trying to re retrofit old structures in, in the city. And luckily, um, the forethought of folks in the USGS and other um, earthquake geologists um, first included a combined Hayward-Rogers Creek scenario back in 1999. So what that means is shaking estimates from a linked Hayward-Rogers Creek rupture are part of the current national seismic hazard map. So they have considered this as part of a scenario. And um, the uniform California earthquake rupture forecast, which creates um, those probability maps I showed, considers the two faults as separate segments capable of, of rupturing together. So in that last shot, slide, I showed that while we are making strides in, in retrofitting some old buildings, the building that's gone on in San Francisco, which was highlighted in the New York Times article, has gone gangbusters in, in recent decades, and particularly in the building of high rises and skyscrapers. Um, and our seismic, which are not built to withstand the strong earthquakes that the Bay Area is cap capable of having. And the other thing is they're building tall buildings, which are more prone to, to seismic shaking. They're also building them in parts of the city, shown in red, that are likely to liquefy in an earthquake. Those two things together don't, are, don't bode well. Um, and this, this circle is highlighting where you have buildings taller than 240 feet in an area of um, potentially high liquefaction during an earthquake. I, there's an AG. American Geophysical Union is in San Francisco um, most years. It, and every time I go up there to that meeting, I really hope that that's not the time that they're going to have an earthquake in the city, because um, I wouldn't want to be there. But of course, the no sense worrying about things we can't control, right, earthquakes, but we can prepare for them. And so there are lots of things that you can do to prepare yourself and your family for, for earthquakes, um, securing your, your home, making family emergency plans. And we have a lot of information on the USGS and other websites um, that can tell you what you can do to, to prepare for earthquakes. That's it. So I know it strikes slip, um, but when you were talking about the, the movement, the offset between the two layers, is that enough to create some, uh, some significant wave movement in the bay? Or is there not enough water to move around? It's a good question. I don't, it, it hasn't been modeled. In the eight, there was an earthquake, um, the Mar Island earthquake, I'm blanking on the age of it, and they don't know exactly what fault it was on, but it, it created a very small tsunami. Um, there's no evidence of a submarine landslide. Um, but that's one thing that would be interesting to see is the amount of vertical deformation we see on the fault. Could that be enough to produce? It was a very small wave, less than one meter tsunami, but it did displace the seafloor enough to, to cause a wave. Yeah, that's a good question. Regarding the gas in San Pablo Bay, yeah. is there any reason to think that could um, 
provide some precursor indication of a large earthquake, like a release of additional gas? I don't, hmm, I don't know. Um, I don't think so. I think the, the gas that's in San Pablo Bay is sort of always slowly releasing, but there could be, I was curious, because we went out to do our imaging right after the Napa earthquake that wasn't that far away, and I thought, oh, maybe it shook all that gas out. No, you know, it didn't, didn't really, we didn't see any evidence of, um, well, it's hard to see in our seismic data evidence for liquefaction, um, and the tidal cycles, um, currents are so strong in the bay that bathymetry w wouldn't really um, record anything like that. So it's a, it's a good question. And, and I'm not sure these ga the gases that you see in San Pablo Bay is common to all estuaries um, where you have a lot of organic matter in the sediment. There was another question. Yeah, I was uh, reading that with the southern part of the Hayward Fault, there's uh, maybe some connection extending to the Calaveras. Mm -hmm. And so how would the projections magnitude differ in that case if it's all kind of connected all the way up there? Well, I don't know the specific numbers, but of course all of these, you're right, there, there is evidence. We're always finding more and more evidence that these faults are a lot more interconnected than we originally, originally thought. Um, and yeah, there are scenarios in the, the California earthquake, um, the USURF model that I mentioned that have faults breaking all the way from you know Northern California to Southern California, but of course, the likelihood of those are so, is so small um, that they're not um, considered very likely, um, and there isn't it, there isn't any evidence um, in the Paleoseismic record as yet that the that the Calaveras and the Hayward have gone together. But of course, they are connected, and it is it is a possibility. Well, the, dip, the geometry of the fault definitely will affect sort of the dynamics in an earthquake rupture and how the ground shakes. Um, but a, an earthquake rupture is just as likely on a dipping fault as a, as a vertical, a vertical fault. Um, and it's a, it's a very steep dip there. The dip doesn't change very much on either side of the, that step over. So it's not a large changing dip. Well, my question is, we're mostly about the cores. <laughs> that you didn't hear much about? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'll skip those. But uh, uh, I was uh, actually one of the sort of the, the chirp data is just so beautiful. I mean, it's, I mean, you're looking at like a couple of meters, all this lamination. I mean, it's, it's just amazing how high resolution. So it's going to be so cool when you start correlating the cores and the actual size of the Yeah, and one thing I should mention is. Um, when we just had the seismic data, you, you'd play these tricks with trying to offset layers and match things up on either side of the fault. And I'd done a, a number of scenarios where, okay, I think this layer matches here, this layer. But then when we went in cord and started getting ages back, found out that, oh, yeah, my, my ideas were, were quite off in matching the, the, the layers up on either side of the fault. Yeah. 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 But it would be interesting to see what are the reflectors. I mean, why you have such a massive fault. You, you know that? Well, most in the cores, they're predominantly f very fine sand and mud. Um, but there is a distinct change at, at a certain depth in the cores, about a meter, a meter and a half down, where it goes from this predominantly mud to having s more sand incorporated. And um, it could be, yeah, because I, and I think the the hydraulic mining in the Sierras brought down a lot of sediment into San Francisco Bay, and that should leave a signature in the bay, and I think that would be associated with more sand, um, and the mud would be post that influx. And so you can use that to be... Yeah, consumer. not by itself, yeah. but yeah, we've noticed that, and so now, yeah, now we're... Um, we're uh, 
using a bunch of different dating techniques, lead to TEM and, and cesium that are, are good at looking at the last um, uh, 100 years or so, and also radiocarbon dating, which is good at looking at stuff older than about 200 years. But we're also incorporating um, chemical analysis, down core chemical analysis, to try, try to identify the influx of this hydraulic mining debris, um, which would have mercury and other heavy metals. One was that one of the, the, the chirp, um, you know, the, the east-west running chirp profiles looked, showed some really nice coruscites, I mean, like real coruscites, and others didn't. So I wonder how much, uh, how much you'll be able to tease out the, um, the events related to potential earthquake from the normal dynamics of the you know, belt of the positive. I mean, there's a lot of gravitational stuff going on, so I don't know how much you'll be able to no, you're, you're right. It'll be very tricky, but um, we've gone out and we, so we have those cross lines, but we also have strike lines to sort of get an idea of the 3D. There are certain unconformities in the, in the bay that we're you trying to, surfaces. Yeah, yeah, you have to look at sort of the 3D stratigraphy to try to understand because there's some other, there are some other interesting features in the bay that could be fault related or they could be simply cut and fill right, that's what we're saying. from channelization. Exactly, and with we've tried to use deeper imaging techniques, but the gas is a problem. Um, and yeah, we're hoping maybe within the cores there'd be some sort of evidence for chan you know channel deposition or erosion versus just regular sedimentation. Um, so the other thing, finally, I, you know, you were showing how you know some of the chart profiles are showing the you know the vehicle default east to the west, the kind of job. Yet the gravity and the magnetic anomalies are pretty, I mean, really cool, I, you know, high frequency. But, you know, they show these two blocks uh, quite flat, nicely. So I was kind of surprised because, I mean, how come you have, you know, how come the basement is so well defined, yet the default when it gets to the surface is a little, I mean, is that? It's a matter, I think it's a matter of scale because, um, Primarily, yeah, because we're looking at changes in the chirp data on the order of centimeters to meters, right? And in the, the potential field data, the gravity magnetics, we're looking at hun hundreds of meters, you know, hundreds of meters. And so you're not going to. Yeah, and we know that faults tend to, oftentimes, the geometry is much simpler at deeper depths. And then once you get to the surface, it kind of goes. It can explode into a flower so structure. Yeah. Any type of fault. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't yeah. Matter. Yeah. That's why it, it's. It was striking to me that there was such a yeah. clear-cut surface easy. expression um, in the bay. And the one thing I didn't mention is that so the Hayward Fault is known for the fact that it creeps, has a size and it creep along it. And so there's this idea that there's that creep could continue into San Pablo Bay. So some of the deformation we're seeing could be creep and not co-seismic motion on the fault. But that's good for the hazard of it, view. It is, you yeah. Can, you can produce 7.4 or something. Yeah, because the Hayward Fault is creeping, but, not, but only near the surface. So it's releasing um, that stress near the surface, but it's not creeping at depth. So it's building up stress at, at depth. And there have been a lot of studies looking at the, the, the depth of that creep versus locked, and they've used that to, to calculate sort of how much moment has been accumulated on the fault. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much.